Hello again and welcome back to this episode of the Marginal Babble Podcast. We're very excited that you've taken the time to join us again today. In today's episode, I sit down and talk to Dr. Sherry Marcos out of the University of Essex to discuss monetary policy, the banking sector and public policy that's going to affect the UK economy and across the world over time. Sherry has been a professor at the Essex University Economics Department since 2006 and holds a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics. Sherry is well known for her interdisciplinary work, which started when she helped found the Centre for Computational Finance and Economic Agents from 2002 to 2009. She was awarded the Rice University Eubank Prize for Systematic Risk Modelling, and her recent work on complex economics has led to her foundational work on novelty production from first principles. My interest in Sherry's work was sparked by her paper on why banks do not lend to businesses. We kick off the discussion with Sherry's take on the 2007 financial crisis and why policy that has been implemented has failed. She outlines that a major reason for policy failure is due to uber-intelligent rule-breaking regulators who are highly innovative and protean. She claims failures of policy design arise from deep problems due to our extant model of rational and game theory that exclude our capacity to think outside the box and be strategically innovative, which she calls human proteinism. As ever, reference research material will be included in the description down below. And without further ado, let's get into the episode. Enjoy. The question about why banks don't lend to the real economy is really a hot topic, but it's one that's been... Uh, in the offing for a long time, you know, banks haven't been lend- lending to the real economy for some time. It's not yeah. a recent uh, phenomena. I mean, w- the other day we had maybe three years ago, prior to COVID, you know, Douglas Gale, who taught me monetary economics at the London School of Economics. He's now an em- uh, eminor- an emeritus professor at Imperial College. He came to uh, University of Essex g- to give a talk about bank lending. And he started off with the premise that all textbooks do that banks lend to corporates or to the uh, to the real economy to firms. So I put my hand up and said, Douglas, what world do you live in? Banks don't lend. I mean, you know, this is there's this um, graph that I got from somebody who gave another talk, Ollie Burrows from the Bank of England, and I remember him saying, you know, less than about. 10% of total bank lending is to the what they call the non non financial corporate sector that is to big big firms and small and medium sized enterprises so it's been a while since banks have lent to the real economy in in substantial ways so where who are they lending to so uh, bank lending is about 3.75 trillion currently in the total bank lending you know give or take and of course there are small fluctuations but all of, of all that money, of all of that money, very little gets to the real economy. That is the bottom line. So most of it is lent amongst themselves, right? The bulk of the money is lent to themselves, to, within the financial sector itself. And the rest is then what they call the big mortgaging up. You know, I think Morris Shularik uh, talked about how suddenly uh, there's a big bump and the big uh, watch of bank lending is to mortgages. So why is it that uh, they don't lend to the real economy? So let's park that for a while and then go to the QE thing. So as you know, in 2007 and eight, uh, you know, I would say we were on the brink of a complete total collapse of the financial sector. Hmm. You know, regulators were asleep at the switch. Um, you know, people like Alan Greenspan poo-pooed the idea of uh, how a house price bubble could end up you know, in this huge mess we were in at the time. And of course, the long shadow it has cast over, um, you know, the decade after is just, we're still bearing, you know, survey, you know, bearing the brunt of what happened in 2007, eight, and in the run up to that. Because the reason is, you see, banks had changed their business model from what we call traditional banking. Uh, traditional banking is where if banks uh, initiated a loan, it would be left kept on its balance sheet till either the loan is repaid or it is reneged on or defaulted on. Instead, they had this new business model called securitized banking, where you know I'll say that securitized bank, secur, you know, securitizing illiquid loans is a innovation of great merit. Except it went on steroids; it was not regulated, and suddenly large their their entire business model was to just generate loans and most right. of these loans form mortgages you know the story they give it away to subprime 
uh, debtors, mortgages who simply didn't have jobs, no chance of paying back. Right. Because what did they care? They say they dropped all principles of due diligence because they say we're going to bundle it all up and sell it on to a third party. Sure. And I think that's an interesting point because it, usually when people talk about the 2008 financial crisis and those, you know, uh, securitized debt sort of instruments that were implemented, I think there's sort of a very not negative connotation around them. But in theory, at least, there's a, there's a great... Um, there's a great use to them in terms of why they were implemented, you know, in terms of mitigating risks and sort of packaging them in them that way. Obviously, it's, at least from what I understand, it's basically led to an over pushing of um, mortgages um, that, like you say, people that necessarily couldn't pay them back. And as a result, it's when people defaulted on those, it basically sent the system into like spiraling down um, in a way that's obviously, as we know, caused the 2008 financial crash. But Beyond that, obviously, you were talking as, as well there about the, the tra traditional role of a bank in terms of it loading into the private sector, which I think that most of uh, the general public actually do generally believe that that's the institution of a bank in a way that sort of facilitates the economy. It takes money that is potentially being sat in stores, right? And like it's being, being loaned out to businesses that can end up being productive. But in, actual, in actuality, it, barely a fraction of that is actually being used in that manner by the sounds of it. Yes, so you know we, we have to rethink what are banks here uh, put on this earth for, right? I and mean, what are the you know what are they to fulfil? I mean, uh, I, I mean, I teach a very popular second year course. I was brought back the other day to teach it. To, to teach a long time ago because you know things have moved on, and then the course hadn't sort of kept up with um, you know the, the the breakneck speed with which events were moving the financial markets and you know that sort of thing. So. And I teach it in a way that, uh, you know, make you make the small hair stand up on the back of your neck because we have to emphasize how banks haven't been behave have been behaving badly for a long time. But they're responding to incentives. That's the first thing all economists know. It isn't that willy nilly, uh, you know, they started breaking all the capital uh, requirement rules, because one of the reasons why initially uh, securitized banking became um, a very good business model for banks was, you know, they say we've taken assets off our balance sheet. We don't need to hold that much capital. So it was an evasive tactic. Uh, you know, the, the euphemism is saying is that they were conducting regulatory arbitrage. In other words, they're finding innovative ways to go to go around rules. Yeah. So that's how it began. Be be began. But then uh, we had what's called Basel II capital regulations, which said, all right, anyway, they, they're trying to skip away and not hold that much capital. Let's have what's called synthetic securitization. Now here, banks were not breaking any rule. In fact, they were following the letter of the rule, but the rule were, rules were badly designed. So the biggest chunk of what went really wrong about banks, um, you know, going into this um, high gear of securitization, where they then invented even more um, securities like credit default swaps are uh, linked to, to uh, you know, the asset side of the banks and uh, collateralized debt obligations and so on and so forth. Uh, this whole 14 trillion worth of shadow banking that just grew was, was actually as a result of huge incentives that were given by bank regulatory uh, capital rules. So what was the rule that was there uh, that led to this second phase, which we call synthetic securitization. It was this premise that um, economists had that um, if you if banks could use credit derivatives to safeguard the default risk that all all loans would have, if they could hide that off their balance sheet, we are, they were told they could reduce capital from eight percent to 1.6% because now this is going to be the big uh, reason why banks don't lend to the real economy. It's part and parcel of what, what happened. It's called risk weights. Uh, something Somebody very clever said, oh, well, let's categorize bank loans under different headings of risk, hmm. right? Seems very cloak and dagger almost. To... Yeah. I mean, you know, so, so the minute they were told, okay, so how would you categorize uh, the bank balance sheet, the asset side, according to risk. So they say, okay, if you're lending, um, uh, this is where uh, the whole story is going to go to. If you lend to uh, SMEs, for instance, you've got to hold 
8% capital, so the risk weight is 100%. So it's deemed risky. So ahead of time, you're already sort of putting your thumb on the scale by saying, don't lend to SMEs because that's going to come down the road. But so where did the, then they said, oh, uh, government bonds will have zero risk weight because of course the sovereigns are not going to uh, fail, right? Bad assumption, bad yeah. assumption. So where so banks that had nothing to do, and then of course, what did they give mortgages? They gave them a fifty percent risk weight. So you only hold, have to hold four percent capital instead of eight percent capital. So the capital requirement is like for every hundred pounds, you need to have eight pounds worth of capital. This is the the yeah. uh, basic rule to begin with before any risk weighting. Sure. Uh, but then they made it complex by giving different categories of loans different risk weights. Guess right. what? They gained the system. Right. The, so though the amount of lending went through the roof, so there's a famous graph by Viracharya and Richardson, uh, where you know we can show that the the total amount of uh, bank assets went through the roof, but the risk weighted virtually was flat like a pancake. So they were gaming the system right. to put uh, to make their loans in those categories of risk. Uh, uh, th those categories of loans where they're going to get low risk weights. Right. So, of course, right from the start, SMEs had a chance. I mean, so we, we will get to... Uh, so, this was called the Great Mortgaging Up because, uh, you know, Maurice Schlara said that um, they had two incentives now. Uh, firstly, uh, and then the risk weight on um, mortgage-backed securities so what they did was they were securitizing, but then they brought back a lot of the security back on their balance sheet as a mortgage-backed security. And then the synthetic securitization allowed them to hold only 1.6% of capital against so-called mortgage-backed securities because there's a risk, was a, risk, a risk weight of 20%. So you multiply 0 0.2 with 0 0.08, you get 1.6. So what's a leverage on that? Leverage is the inverse. A leverage is that you divide now one by uh, 1.125, which is uh, the the uh, the risk the, the risk weight. You know the risk weight was two times eight one point. Oh, sorry, it was 1.65 is the the um, capital requirements on the synthetic securitization. And the requirement is that now you get credit default swaps. Uh, which is a, a insurance sort of cover for if should there be a um, a, a credit event or default on your mortgage backed securities, you would get a AAA rated agent, right? Now this is where the whole story, you know, this is what led to the bigger unraveling. You would have a, a AAA rated agent give you credit default swaps because they're AAA rated, right. uh, and just because they're AAA rated, but then it doesn't stand the test of time at all. It runs into Goodhart's law immediately. You say you get, you know, what Goodhart's law is. Goodhart's law. Charles Goodhart is somebody I really admire, and he's I think one of the two big great ideas from the LSE from the 1980s came from Charles Goodhart, and the other is Ken Binmore, who I'll perhaps talk about later on. Game theorists. But they said, so Charles Goddard's theory is that any statistical measure that has made a target of policy becomes a poor measure. Right. So the minute you say you allow AAA rated agents to give you credit default swap cover for um, risk, your AAA rating is already in question. Right, so well, they're not really acting in a, in a manner which we prefer as AAA rating. No, because because now you'd be they'd be taking on all the risk, right? right? So how can they be? How can they continue to be AAA rated? And then there are very few entities in this, in, the, in this universe. It's AAA rated. One of these entities was American Insurance Group (AIG). They never had anything to do with financial uh, products. You know, they they did this garden variety life insurance, car insurance, you know, that sort of thing. A two hundred year old. Um, a corporation in America, they said, well, we are AAA rated. Why don't we issue some credit default swaps? But then they issued gigantic quantities of credit default swaps. It's finally, from like from 2002 to 2006, this credit default swap market grew from zero to 60 trillion. So it was written that time frame from about 2002 onwards that yeah. this all started. So again, great, great invention, credit default swaps. Don't look at me wrong. And was it just that the 
the idea was conceived or was there some sort of regulation change that allowed for... Yeah, so the regulation that made credit, made credit default swaps, uh, you know, routine activity for banks was the Basel II uh requirement that now you could reduce capital uh, from 8% to 1.6% by using the 20% risk weight, right? Right. You can reduce capital if you got yourself a credit default swap from a AAA rated entity. Now, everybody is queuing up, every bank under the sun was in America, that is, queuing up to get a credit default swap from a AAA rated agent. AIG being AAA rated jumped into the fray. Yeah. And then, of course, they took on all the risk under the, you know, amounts of risk. So they, so, so while you could do that, so as capital requirements fell, the leverage was like, if you divide one by 0. 0.0165, the leverage was almost 60, six, between 62 to 65 times. So for every dollar or every pound, you could now lend out 65 times. Yeah, really. And this is what we call hedge fund level. So, so mm. banks really nearly overnight became like hedge funds. Right. Now, and so there was no now, so you are then getting this uh, AAA rated agent to give you, but the minute that AAA rated agent, everybody, if you follow the money, which was not regulated, you found that everybody and his dog was getting AAA uh, credit default swaps from AIG. Has there been any change in regulation since the financial crisis to sort of, in regards to those kind risk of, waiting. In regards to those institutions and, you know, those kind of um, ratings of, um, sort of risk level in terms of into whether they've actually been able to, whether those AAA rated institutions are actually able to even do things like this. Well, what happened was that that entire market segment collapsed. Mm. You know, credit default swaps as attached to uh, RMBS, which is residential mortgage backed securities, that entire process fell apart, right? Because what happened was when the house prices, because the mortgage backed securities are, are premised, their value is premised on the the value of the house, right? Correct, the minute yeah. there was a house price collapse, those pieces of paper, Don't become valuable they became worthless and there was nobody to guarantee because the margin calls against AIG led to it being bailed out by the federal, you know, by the treasury, the US treasury had to step in and they literally had to pay off everybody without a haircut, you know, everybody in, you know, who was using AIG to guarantee their balance sheet to the bank. So this was actually one of the mega uh, things that detonated the great financial crisis. The other thing was that these uh, liabilities, sorry, the assets that were generated, all these mortgage-backed securities that were used, generated by the banks, right? Uh, this, this is, I'll give you a parallel of, of something that happened just last week. So the bank's assets that it generates, the loans that it gives out, those pieces of paper, now it's more securitized or whatever, were then used to generate liquidity in the repo market, right? They use their own uh, own assets to then underpin as collateral borrowing that they were going to do in the interbank market, in the in what they call repo. And then that also fell apart because what happened was they were using these pieces of paper that were backed by um, you know house prices to borrow money uh, short term in the short term money markets from other financial institutions uh, to what to fund their long term liabilities uh, sorry long term uh, loans on the mortgage market so that is how you know institutions like northern rock fell apart because uh, you know the minute you use a piece of paper uh, to borrow money if that collateral, then you lose its value, which it did when the house prices fell, um, nobody was prepared to lend on it. And mm. then again, the, uh, you know, the um, Federal Reserve unprecedentedly had to buy all these toxic mortgage-backed securities because it had to become what will about to cause uh, the market maker of last resort. There was no nobody prepared to hold that. Mm. And these were called the asset-backed commercial paper conduits, which are over 300 billion large so that also fell apart so everything associated with the leveraging up so to 65 times leverage is as i told you banks were made into hedge funds but yeah. they didn't become that way of yeah. their own times are just a, you know, yeah. crazy amount crazy amount i mean so and was there enough enough enough, enough uh, reserves or enough liquidity or anything like that no none of that was regulated they were just told so these are all 
errors of such such proportions of very poor design of of uh, of regulation it's called perverse incentives and then of course would be called um, fallacy of composition which is true for one bank is not true for the whole system we we've, we've developed what are called agent based models which said that the first thing any regulator needs to do is to make sure take their regulation and have everybody follow the letter of the law it means to say have them everybody if you give incentives of this ilk you know say you can reduce capital from 8% to 1.6% who wouldn't jump at that right yeah. but what is true for one bank is not true for the system as a whole because if everybody did that whoever has to guarantee all that risk all the credit risk that they would be generating with 65 times leverage wouldn't have the liquid assets they ran out of money aig when the margin calls came against them as their credit default swap started to detonate as the underlying bonds such as the arm the residential mortgage backed securities lost value they were getting margin calls thick and fast and they didn't have any reserves put aside no. to meet that which is obviously just the risk of being so highly leveraged right just in the first place yeah it was important there was nobody who would have that sort of liquidity no. so why did you know so what i'm saying is you know this is now called systemic risk you know we should have joined up thinking we should have digital mapping of financial systems you know you know i did a big project at the reserve bank of india where we digitally map the financial system so we can understand it's it's an idea that andrew haldin um in his famous talk uh, at the student union of the Am- university of amsterdam said rethinking financial networks well, we haven't done anything like that nobody knows where you know where bottlenecks are we have to know who owes whom what in the financial system map it all out because yeah. without that and at some level of granularity this is not how economics and macroeconomics is done macroeconomics is done at a very uh, aggregated yes uh, level so you know like they don't i would say put every bank into the system and then you know work out how they connect it together so yeah. the paper we you you talk about why banks don't let in the real economy and quantitative easing um so we we'll got get, get at that but that is what we call an agent based model we will put every bank's ba- you know balance sheets in it every bank is there literally like in you know like it is you know you yeah. don't you don't um because we need to know the exact positions that even even quarterly would do you don't need you know because these things take a while to build up then you'll see certain bits of their balance sheets are growing and that should la- raise alarm bells so the way in which we teach economics and macroeconomics is very poor in the sense that it's not granular enough it's not mm. digitized I means so we don't we're not using all our uh, technical capabilities like you know right. the big big data i mean why don't macroeconomists use that and see the interconnections well i guess well just i guess like we're moving into an era like say of big data where this information is you know more freely available than it is, has ever been before i guess the the barrier to that is just the sheer volume of data and being able to uh, analyze it and use it in an effective way where you are you are actually able to compute a model like that it seems like a in an ordinary amount of analysis and work that would have to be going to do it yes but you know we we have to understand what would be so core flow of funds you know this is not how macro is taught right we need to understand how money flows from one entity to another mm-hmm. uh, and across sectors so not just within sectors but across sectors now this is not i mean i i i i've spent a lot of my time and effort trying to say this is how we should do macro uh, we need to understand these flow of funds because otherwise you will never know what what the problem is going to be yeah and secondly we have to understand how when you put in powerful regulation like a, a, a global banking regulation one which one which says that you know you you can reduce capital from 8% to 1.6% i mean you don't have to have a phd or anything like that that would immediately rec- we'll see we'll give we'll ba- give banks you know incentive to behave in a certain way and all of them would herd in a certain direction right all of these things are destabilizing so why did they why did uh, regulators think the, this is a shadowy group that lives in i don't know the bank of international settlement basel is this sit town or city in uh, switzerland where some uh, unelected lot of people who are totally unaccountable you know are setting up these rules and i call it queen's english it reads very well but the minute you then stress test it they never stress test their own regulations 
which is the first requirement my 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 book for robust regulation we've got to stress test these rules it's, instead of stress testing the banks what we need to do is if you're setting up these big incentives you've got to stress test that if everybody were to follow that incentive what would be the consequences if everybody were to borrow mm. i mean were to buy credit default swaps from three or four uh to play entities would those entities be able to withstand sudden uh you know loss of value in a market you know you're setting up we're setting ourselves up for big uh you know destabilizing movements by doing the by badly designed um uh, financial regulation or banking regulation sure and Whose responsibility do you think it falls on in order to be able to conduct those stress tests? It, does it fall on the responsibility of central banks? Does it fall on the responsibility of governments and uh, associated policies? Or does it fall on the actual institution, the banks themselves? So, so this is a very big question, isn't it? I mean, who, who you know, if, if uh, there is an entity called the BCBS, right, or whatever that's, you know, the banking, the where they set up these bank regulations, right? Um, they, they're not elected representatives. They are like, uh, I don't know, uh, they're just there. Mm. And then, and yet what they say has to be implemented by banks. Now, uh, so, so the risk weights, in my opinion, it's a very dangerous thing because the risk weights is giving people uh, banks incentives because it is going to impact on how much capital they will hold against yeah, each yeah. type of um, bank, bank loans. Yeah. So if you say that SMEs or bank loans to corporates according to their, uh, you know, it sounds sensible. Now on, on the surface, it does sound sensible. But if everybody does it, then SMEs are going to be literally out in the cold. Hmm. So, you know, but SMEs are almost 98% of all businesses in, in a country, you know, yeah. in an economy. And they're the lifeblood and they're all been... Uh, starved of, yeah. uh, you know, credit. The true value adding industries. And Absolutely. Value. So they've been dying on the vines for yonks. So so then we're coming to things fell apart, as you know, and we had the great financial crisis. Lehman Brothers collapsed. AIG had to be bailed out. Uh, you know, I was looking at how much how much of bailout. You know, according to um, you know um, um, Andrew Haldane and Alessandri, it's called paper banking on the state, and they say it's 14 trillion. The bill to the taxpayer was in the order of 14 trillion. So the world GDP on a on a year to year basis is about 70 trillion. Hmm. So you know a sizable amount had to be literally um, you know pumped in to save these banks, right? Now you'd say why do we need to save them? You know, like uh, Hank Paulson apparently went to. I think it's a very common heard... question most of, <laughs> most of the public would have in terms of this if they institutions are causing such issues then you know why is it that they need to be said well because you know one short answer is you know the so-called liabilities of a bank you know the bank deposit money and uh, again a very large you know very almost 98 percent of all or all, all money that we use as means of payment is uh private commercial bank private liabilities because uh that is a big um that is a big privilege commercial banks have yes i mean they're bulk of the the liability side is our deposits from which we have to make payments yeah from the general public for the general public so then of course if they go under you know this is what one of the reasons why cryptocurrencies i mean you know nakamoto's white paper was all about we can't trust commercial banks not mm. because the current payment and settlement system is if inefficient in fact it's very very efficient the electronic fund transfer point of sale yeah, all of that exactly. that's another area that i've done a lot of research on cashlessness Nothing wrong with that. That is very efficient. The cost of putting a payment through perfectly valid, validated these card payments, hugely efficient. Absolutely. And just in terms of being able to make payments quickly and effectively and make decisions, it's definitely sort of revolutionized, you know, in the same way, potentially, you know, in the sense of coinage being used instead of going from like a barter economy. You know, it's, it's very, very important, particularly yeah. on a global sense. So the cashlessness that commercial banks have, are, are underpinning via our cards, card, you know, um, you know, master, Visa, Mastercard, all that sort of. That's phenomenally efficient. That's not where uh, banks fail is. It's from the asset side. They lend out too much. They were leveraged mm. up to the hilt. 
But then if they're going to be insolvent, they're going under, then so would all our payment system go to pieces, right? Right. So it wasn't that the, the payment system per, per se is inefficient. It's the most efficient, uh, you know, by far in a very long time. But of course, banks were responsible. Commercial banks were going to go under because of all this other hanky-panky they were doing, mm. you, know, you know, with the securitized mortgages and credit default swaps or collateralized debt obligations, all that. That fell apart. So they then had to be saved, right? And 14 trillion to be pumped in. And we're paying the price of that even to this day, all this austerity, because, you know, what, what, what nature, the nature of financial risk is what we call correlated risk, you know. So whoever steps in, this is like somebody, you know, if you see a friend drowning and you jump in, very likely you could be pulled under as well. Right. So, you know, the, the sovereign then becomes on the hook all this you know had to, we had to go to deficit spending you know we had to go to austerity we had to cut back on all sorts of things you know, it's just desperate times it, it really is and this is not happening in third world countries this is happening in these most advanced economies and what well, you know with uh, complex financial institutions and and advice by people who come from harvard and mit and so on you know when i went to the Reserve Bank of India, and I said, don't bring a single North American macro monetary person to advise you. They did, a, And they themselves said, you know, I remember Shamala Gopinath, who was the big power behind the throne. She was a deputy governor. Uh, this is at a time India had deputy governors were women long before they, you know, in, in, in England and all that. I mean, I don't even think we have had either a deputy governor or a governor who's female. I mean, so she said, she said, we did a better job in India uh, than all these you know, highfalutin monetary and macroeconomists in the West with all their crazy modeling, you know, because they simply, their models are insufficient in detail, which you could then fill in either with intuition, which is what they do in India. It's not because they've got fancy model, but they've got very strong intuitions about what is working and what is not. And they're not overwhelmed by, if you can't show it in a model with, you know, only certain models are given the time of day in the West. I found them not to be doctrinaire at all. They're not ideologues. They're very pragmatic. And if they said, you know, they're not completely awed by, uh, you know, when we had the credit default swap mathematics, if they didn't understand it, it doesn't make any common sense, right? Yeah. They'll just, they just ban it. Is that coming from a difference in where their, their economists are being educated at the university? Is it a different in the knowledge that, you know, and the, or the skill level, the skill sets that they're being implemented with in, uh, in comparison to some developed you know, economies, you know, like you say, you know, Harvard for the States or Oxford, Cambridge, LSE from the UK? I'll tell you, there is, there's a very interesting thing that's happened to the UK economics. I mean, UK economics, firstly, we are under a heavy heavy burden of what's called research excellence framework and, uh, and there are no original thinkers in my opinion when i first came to england in the late th- 80s and so on i mean it was still i mean we could still think about a hayek or a keynes or you know very big original thinkers like Karl popper somebody said the person who hired me at uh, university of essex somebody called tony sharks he said in the 1950s 60s and even 70s you walk into somebody's lecture and they can rearrange your brain because you know they're original thinkers. So you need a certain amount of um, mojo, you know, intellectual confidence to put out your ideas out there, you know, and have it. Oh, well, yeah. but that's all disappeared. We we began to scissor and paste from North American macroeconomics. That was the downfall of British macro thinking. The British are some of the best strategists. You know, they wouldn't have become the colonial masters of their day if they didn't have huge amounts of strategy and common sense and they muddle along. I mean, this is something where, you know, they're not necessarily ideologues. They are pragmatists, you know, Mm. they go for what works and they they are, you know, whereas what happened in North American macro is they became ideologues about a certain type of thinking and model and in particular rationality, which, uh, you know, I'm challenging, you know, the idea of rationality completely bogus. They think that the only thing we should do uh, is you do the best from what what you know so they've you know they ha, ha, that's called searching under the lamppost and i'm saying the way we've become intelligent is not by thinking about what we already know we are actively trying to work out basically because we are in this adversarial game we're trying to work out what the enemy is going to do vis-a-vis your own actions, yeah. actions and therefore you have to anticipate what they have to do 
and we have astronomic capabilities, 10 to the power 20, 20 to the power 30, capability of thinking outside the box. Now, you never hear that sort of rationality being talked about in their narrow idea of what is rational. So why are we doing that? Because sometimes, you know, there is a Nash equilibrium in which we are forced to play a novel strategy, which was not on your original action set. So in all of this thing, where did things go wrong? Why did our um, policy making, policy design, the regulatory framework, and totally irrelevant to how people really behave? Uh, I, you know, my my PhD uh, thesis was about uh, uh, the the mainstream um, macroeconomic way in which things are designed. It's called control theory. We borrowed from engineering and it's all about sending a rocket to the moon so the idea there is the only thing between you and achieving your objective like getting the rocket to the moon is what's called white noise right now think think back on what really went wrong in uh, in the way in which policy you know they set out a policy next thing you knew you had all these good hearts law in other words we have what i call protean behaviors uh human beings the most prolific in terms of brain capabilities of thinking outside the box and innovating, which is completely missing in economics. There is no talk about strategic innovation that we might strategically decide tomorrow we're going to invent something new uh, to to break certain rules. So rule breaking. Just disrupt the games. Exactly, disrupt the game. That is missing in game theory. That is what we do most of the time. You know, we are there to break the rules, yet they believe that somehow we'll just tick a box, they don't conceive of the fact that, you know, we would actually actively do something to to break the rule, to disrupt the game, right? That's missing in Mm. current design of policy because they've got these, uh, you know, econometric models or some sort of economic models where the only thing that the only way in which things can change is by random shocks. Right. Hello, I'm saying it's not random shock. There's somebody no. with uber intelligence working to disrupt that world. That is missing. Yes. The only people who's actually brought that up to my uh, to my uh, attention is was Charles Goodhart. You know, Goodhart's law is all about that. The minute you've announced something, it's finished. It, it's also called the Lucas critique. Except macroeconomists never never understood this as being active protein behaviors of uber intelligent agents who are going to disrupt and break a rule so they don't look they don't look at what i call horizon scanning they don't see if i were to put this rule out how is it going to be uh destroyed or you know that's that is you know mitigated mitig- or, yeah. yeah exactly that that's it is though it's well understood in macroeconomics it's called the lucas critique and lucas said robert luke said that if anybody can predict you, he will negate you, right? Sure. It'll be rendered ineffective. And this is a very long tradition of what we call, um, I mean, you know, it's sometimes uh, somebody uh, called uh, Hirschman, A.O. Hirschman says, it's a rhetoric of reaction that uh, everything will either be, you know, he calls it the perversity, uh, jeopardy, um, uh, you know, he calls it the, um, you know, he says, if a rule's put out there, It'll either be negated and he, it, it'll be rendered futile, which is what Bob Lucas said, that you put something out there, before you know it, the private sector or the regulatees have rendered it, he's predicted you or they've predicted you and they're going to do the opposite. It's right. going to be rendered and is that, futile. Is that indicative of potentially either the private sector will hedge you off at the past and maybe stop certain regulation from going through? Or is it just from a standpoint of they'll find, they'll research and develop ways to still get to their, their end goals, even while the, the regulation is in place? Absolutely. That means, what, what are we saying? We have, there are conflicting, uh, there are conflicting objectives. Mm-hmm. The regulator may have a set of objectives, but that may not be in cahoots with what the private sector or the, uh, or the rank and file want. More frequently, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, so the negation rule is very powerful. You know, Bob, uh, uh, you know, Bob, George Soros. So these things were coming alive to me. You know, I was saying, God, they misunderstood what Lucas, what is Bob Lucas saying, and Bob Bob Lucas is the person who said that uh, if somebody's going to negate what he what he can predict. So you know, if you know my hand, mm-hmm. you're going to negate me. Hello, then will I show you? Can I play with? Can I? Can yeah. I play a deterministic 
uh, strategy? Can I show you my hand or uh, you know what I'm going to do? No, I, the Nash equilibrium of that game is to surprise, is to produce novelty. Now, when I said to people, you've un misunderstood, they thought novelty. So, you know what, in Bob Lucas's framework, he put novelty into surprise inflation. You know, the story is that, uh, you know, the natural rate story was that completely, I mean, you know, how anybody could take any of this seriously, uh, it is beyond me. They say that, you know, the private sector could predict the level of inflation, you know, that the authorities are going to uh, bring about. And therefore, they would take ways to, they'd find ways around to, uh, you know, to, to get around that, right? So, so Bob Lucas said that the only way in which a policy can be effective is if, if you can surprise people, but it was put into a form like a prediction error, like noise again, white noise. So, uh, but that sounds like, in other words, he says that if you want to get any growth, you've got to surprise people with inflation. <laughs> Right. So, so, so. <laughs> now, how crazy does that sound? Yeah. But on, on paper, that looked quite uh, cogent. They says, uh, well, if you want to get somebody to do something beyond the natural rate of all these so crazy things that they talk about, uh, you have to somehow surprise, you have to uh, conduct surprise inflation. And not give them the, the public and the general private sector a heads up of what you're going to do. So, actually, yeah, get, I mean, to get the effects that you've actually desired. So, so of course, surprise inflation that sounds like a bad thing. But the reason why Lucas said you need to surprise them is because his first two premises were that if they predicted you, he, they would negate you. Hmm. So the Nash equilibrium of that game really is to surprise. But when and you make put yourself it, unpredictable. yeah. But but when you put it in the in the format of authorities have to conduct surprise inflation, that sounds like bad stuff. So then they they then concluded. Therefore, that we sh that authorities are not allowed to surprise; they have to pre-commit. But then the question that people like Charles Goodhart and I ask is, what about what started this line of reasoning? Was because they could predict what what you were going to do; they were going to negate you. Therefore, you have to surprise them. So you can't conclude the syllogism doesn't follow. You can't conclude. Therefore, we need to pre-commit. We have to go to determinism again. Hmm. Then what about the fellow who's there out there to negate you? So the reason why Charles Goodhart and Ken Binmore were the most, in my opinion, the the original thinkers in the tradition of British, <laughs> what I call British genius, was because Ken Binmore, who taught me game theory in 1987, wrote this famous paper called Modeling Rational Players. And he brought in the big guns, I mean, to say that this is not anything ordinary. This is at the very heart of logic and the way our, our, we think. He said, he brought in somebody uh, the deepest theorem of mathematics, because he's a, he's a mathematician, right? He said he's, he brought in what's called the specter of Gödel. Uh, you know, people quake in their shoes, you know, when they hear about Gerd, Kurt Gödel because he produced. Uh, and what? Why should we be? Why should? Why did um, Binmore bring in the specter of Gödel? Because he said Gödel had this character called the liar, and liar's business is exactly what Lucas said: is to negate you if he can predict you. If he can comp compute what you're going to do, or he knows your code, hello, you're toast. So who who is Gödel's liar? It's the virus, right? The virus, the adversarial agent. Mm. So the Nash equilibrium of this game is really what happens in in immune systems and that sort of thing. Is once you find out that somebody's going to corrupt your code, you find the identity of this person. You have to produce a new antibody. You can't play any previous things. Hmm. Likewise, if you have perfect recall, uh, the virus itself has to come with a new uh, strategy to destroy your code because if you brought an old strategy for which you had an effective antibody, obviously that's not going to work. Hmm. So the, li the liar will have to produce something new, but then what is the liar going to play? That's why we can't search under the lamppost. A liar will pr produce something novel. He'll play something you are not expecting. How, uh, how so if all of this is missing in game. It's missing in game theory because it's missing in game theory, which is meant to teach us about strategy. It is missing yeah. in policy design. Policy design is all about such strategies, yes. right? It's what is missing is the idea that we can think outside the box. That we are innovative creatures. That we are protein. I, I use the word protein, and this is my big 
a crusade. I mean, I, I decided more than anything that I do, maybe in macro and all that, I've wrote, wrote this paper about how we design, you know, you know, digitally map the financial system, which I went and did in India. I was their senior consultant for four years. We digitally mapped the Indian financial system and uh, keep track of what, how the money is moving and that sort of thing. And then you make out potential systemic risks because you can't make it out by any other means because the mainstream idea about how you can make out systemic risk is people like Viralachari. I mean, Viralachari is very clever in other ways. I've cited him about other papers, which I'll come to in a, in a bit. But uh, they put out something, in my opinion, that was fatally flawed. They said we can use market price data uh, to measure systemic risk. They call it value, COVAR. You know, they're saying the systemic version of value at risk is called COVAR and things like that, right? For which you use market price data to work out whether or not risk is growing in the system. But you can never, market price data will never give you early warning. Okay. You know, uh, why is that? It was only on the day that Lehman Brothers collapsed that the credit default swap rates went up. Right. Charles Goodhart comments on this. Not a day before, not so that means and and the thing about market price data, let's say the stock prices and it's all that. It's very present, like it, in, in the moment. It's in the moment. It's worse than that. It has been well known that uh, these things so our measure of risk is called volatility, the standard deviation of stock returns, right? Mm. And it's meant to be paradoxical. During a boom, when people like Hyman Minsky say that the seeds of the crisis are being uh, sown, because you know that's when banks are lending a lot, there's a lot of leverage, mm -hmm. the seeds of the crisis are being sown. And then the volatility at the time when the market returns are positive or the, the, the stock index is going up and up, volatility is very low. There's very little risk, seemingly. Uh, and when the market collapsed, when he, and, it, and worse still, the day of the of the peak of the boom, volatility is at a low, at, is at a minimum. It is at its lowest point. The day it collapses, volatility jumps up only after the crisis starts. Right. So if Viralacharya want to use market price methods to give you any early warning of systemic risk in the system nothing from market price data would give you that early warning, right? Yeah, yeah. So where would you find the early warning? You have to look at the balance sheets of banks. Who, where's the leverage? How's the leverage building up? Right. And that is the only way, in my opinion, you could really get any early warning. And that will give you ample early warning. So we have a method. Uh, we've got this paper called the R number. You know, we have to look at it just like financial contagion, we have to look at the uh, balance, you know, the matrix of who's owed whom what, and you will find as leverage grows, the R number grows, yeah. the, the potential instability. Uh, so it is a totally different concept to uh, Virilacharya's measure, measure of risk. But we had uh, so much trouble trying to get that published because the orthodoxy is saying, oh, we have to have some uh, systemic risk measured by market price data. And when we said, really, the problem is not about uh, probabilities and market price that you use using statistics for market price data that won't get you any early warning. You have to look at the balance sheet and then it's about the stability of the system. You're looking at a maximum market value. It's a totally different cup of tea. And uh, nobody, and now, you know, we were able to produce paper called the R number because everybody after COVID knows what an R number is. You know, if an R number is greater than one, then the epidemic, right will finally engulf the system if there are no mitigation circumstances, there are no interventions such as vaccines and things like that, if the system is left to its own devices. If R is greater than one, then the epidemic will consume the population. Right. And so we said it's the same thing. If you look at the what the liabilities and assets, because if one, one bank fails, how, how likely is the other bank going to fail? And you just, it's a stability criteria. It's about whether the system becomes stable or unstable, and for which you would look at the maximum eigenvalue of, of that whole matrix, um, you know, and then plot it over time. And then if the R number is greater than one, then you have cause for concern. Right. Now, you know, you know, you would have thought that would make sense. A lot of people would be interested. No. So there's something fundamentally wrong. I mean, you know, people, 
uh, either because they wanted box sticks saying, oh, you know, we we have edit editors. I was in loggerheads with one of the editors. I said, if you continue doing what you do, the same old, same old, right? Mm-hmm. You're not open-minded. You don't see what results, you know, if the results don't work out, you know, which Matt Kovar or uh, Viralacharya and Bruna Maya, these are big names in uh, Stern Business School and MIT and so on and so forth. Hell, I don't care where you're from, but if your results don't stack up, right? So I'm jumping up and down. I say, don't ever use the market price method if you want to know systemic risk. But I'm a voice in the wilderness, you know, because, you know, as my son says, you know, you're, you're stuck in a backwater here in <laughs> Essex, you know. But there are people who, you know, I wasn't invited to uh, a Reserve Bank of India for nothing. You know, they said, yeah, we agree. Uh, well, it seems as though that uh, India, the Indian economy, so you've done some work over there with this com- computational work, they seem to be very willing and open to it. Well, that, that didn't, it didn't, you know, what happened then was after after uh, the day I had in all my software and things like that, you know, there was a crisis that happened in India with their so-called urban and cooperative banks. Okay. Um, and I did one when we first mapped the system. I said two things I wanted was one thing, the reason why that project took off at the time, this is, we're talking about 2013, 2014, you know, um, we we saw a particular bank, you know, not one of the usual suspects. So we are given anonymized data. Mm-hmm. Uh, we use what is called the eigenvector centrality. It's just like Google page page rank, uh, you know, in the network who's who's central, but it's a fixed point. It's not just just finding out how much uh, they're, they're borrowing and lending in the interbank market, which is what we are tracking. Uh, we found that uh, suddenly, like in about 18 months or four or five quarters and things like that, this particular bank uh, was moving up as being the most eigenvector central bank, meaning to say it's systemically important. It was beginning to um, borrow a lot aggressively on the inter- interbank market. Okay. And I said to the, uh, the the top brass, because at every visit I went to report, what did I find? And I told the top brass, um, there you are, you, that's your Northern Rock situation brewing. There's been drop silence because they had come to similar conclusions that this particular bank was winning the the Bank of the Year award and things like that because, mm-hmm. because of course, they were expanding their mortgage markets like crazy. They were borrowing like crazy to lend on to get grow their market shares. So of course, their CEOs were winning Bank of the Year award and things like that. And then, um, you know, in India, of course, they say, you know, if you're, if your loan book starts growing, uh, this is their rule of thumb, if they, the loan book starts growing, you know, doubling and so on, hello, we need to look co- closely at that entity. Yeah, they don't think it is It is just simply, uh, you know, acumen. There must be something. Why would some, a bank's loan book double in size? Well, that seems pretty intuitive reasoning. <laughs> no, you, you tell me. So I, so you don't need eigenvector centrality, but then what, what is good about it, the eigenvector centrality is then exactly would tell you uh, what proportion of total capital the system would lose uh, as a result of this particular bank failing. Right. So I would say that you could then tax the bank according to its centrality. And this is the, uh, this is a policy recommendation and, and the uh, deputy governor in, in India, of course, uh, they would then put a, so you, you, you now have it on the basis of all the data. It's not just anybody's rule of thumb that this is exactly the nature of the trouble that's brewing, going to brew, and therefore it becomes a negative externality to the rest of the system if that particular bank failed. And then uh, I was asked, you know, so this is all in secret. I was asked, what should we, what penalty should we put on this particular bank? I said, charge them proportionate to their centrality. You know, because that is going to be the the extent to which they would become a threat to the rest of the system. And the, you know, the, the behavior wants to disincentivize, I guess. Exactly to disincentivize. You know, so so uh, of course in, in in India they just need to have what we call moral suasion. You know, you have a put put a, put a word in the ear of the CEO. Hello, you know, can't double your loan book like this. <laughs> right. We will penalize you, right? Yeah. And but of course it's not a public name and shame because the minute you publicly name and shame them, then they become an object of you know people can move against them the rest of the, uh, the market so it's got right. to be done but nevertheless unless the authorities have access to this who to whom data right they wouldn't be able to 
without this methodology I'm pro I was proposing, they wouldn't be able to absolutely be clear, roughly even to work out what's a ballpark figure of how much we would penalize them if we need to, because right. it would be the extent of the damage they'd do by their failure, which you could work out. The old days you would do stress tests that by killing the bank, you don't need to kill any bank. You just literally look at the centrality given the data that we've collected. Mm. So I think Reserve Bank was ahead of the game. I think Bank of Mexico, one of my students, somebody called, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, Raf, um, Martinez, uh, um, Serafin Martinez, you know, she, he was trained in the same center I set up at, the, at, at Essex called Center for Computational Finance and Economic Agents. So from the early 2000s, I'd left mainstream economics as such because I said cert certain things in mainstream economics does not take on the board. Uh, on board is firstly what I call complexity that the fact that you and I are protein we think outside the box sure. we change stuff we innovate we mm. strategically finding loopholes and finding innovations to get around it right sure that's completely missing both from macroeconomics game theory yeah. and what have you and, and, this, not, and not just maximize like your response to regulation but as you said if you can see it coming you've had it off in the past Absolutely. So you need to find new ways of breaking the rules, right? Because if you find, if you do it the old way, they'll put you behind bars, perhaps. Mm. But if you find like a credit default swap or a fancy collateralized debt obligation, by the time they find out that's all rubbish or it's going to break break the system, you would have already skipped away with some of the money, right? Mm. So, it's a, so that computational work that you've obviously set up in India. One, do you think that's how, how effective do you think that's been in terms of them being able to regulate that system? And two, it, it, would it be effective? Like, and should it be implemented in sort of the, the, like Europe, UK? I think so. I think I think you know we we're missing uh, you know missing uh, some you know this is within our capabilities. This digital mapping and the idea of Andrew Haldin is like you know like in a James Bond film, you have the full uh, you know the uh, the whole interconnected system, and you see lights flashing and things like that it's literally like that you know when you when, so it's not the current macroeconomics which is condensed into a few equations or they call it heterogeneous because you want to copy paste from you know some new idea that we're saying the world is not homogeneous there are lots of different characters and everything they put that in but if you look at their models it's just missing a lot of what i call institutional detail you can only put all those details in if you have a uh, network agent based model where you place agents in these networks where connected by their if it's financial networks connected by their assets and liabilities the flows that they're owing one another and then you put in the regulation that's important the agents should know what is the regulation because they're all the time trying to uh you know if it's a poorly designed regulation like like we said about the um you know, credit risk uh, mitigation rules that they have for synthetic securitization. The banks were not breaking the rule. They were following the rule because the rule gave them that incentive to reduce capital and then get uh, credit default swaps from AAA mm -hmm. rated agent. So that system then spawns an ecosystem, right? That is so, so dangerous that will tip us right in into what we saw, right? In a, yeah. Into a conflagration. Absolutely. or badly designed policy. It's not just me, people like Barry Ike and Green, uh, you know, Charles Goodhart, we say, now people, lots of people have view that the crisis was entirely made, uh, brought about the extent of the crisis, because you would have had a garden variety of it if it hadn't been synthetic securitization, where they went into collateral, def you know, collateral debt obligations, or they went into these huge quantities, credit default swaps, mm. that nobody in their right mind could ever think that there were enough reserves to support that amount of credit credit, credit default that was going to happen down the road. You know, it was mm. completely um, mismanaged. I mean, so my, in my opinion, these things happen because of bad economics, not for any other reason. Mm. And so the question there is then, if in a hypothetical situation, obviously this is hypothetical, so you know you probably you can't give definitives to anything. But if such computational analysis was available and it was being used in those markets in the lead up to, in the the decades leading up to that financial crisis, is there a way that it could have been headed off for the past or at least somewhat mitigated? It, even now, I mean, you know, so we we are in so so because of the QE because of uh, 
the 2008 crisis, two things happened. You know, interest rates were brought from about four or five percent to zero, virtually 0.25 percent. I mean, in long period. And then we had QE. Okay, so what QE did was, I was looking at the figures in the UK, we had about, about 895 billion QE. Yeah. You know, okay, so what did QE do? This is, and in America, they say it was almost four point four point. You know, the, the the Federal Reserve balance sheet grew from about nine hundred billion by about 2015-16. It grew to about four five four point five trillion. I mean, you know, so I mean, this is unprecedented. Mm. And then we got hooked onto it's like being on a co- cocaine addiction. Yeah, you get the to the effects. Completely, completely, you know. Uh, shouldn't should there have been a task force set up at the IMF that we should have gotten off this binge some time ago by 2014-15, you know, get rid of it, you know, move towards more normalcy, bring the interest rates back up to shape. No, you know, it, because again, why is that? It's because if, if there was a case, you know, he would then have designed something, you know. We are not encouraged as academics. We keep box ticking, box ticking. Nobody's allowed to put their hand up and say, hello, this is not working, this is not... The minute you're done that, you're shot down, like, or your look at my R, R, R number paper. We couldn't get it published anywhere. It was, it, I'm telling you the details it had, it was, they just took offense that it was challenging. And of course, I'm not going to mince words. So I challenge, I say that the existing thing is not working. And then mm-hmm. a referee say, oh, you can't be that critical. Hello, why can't you be critical? Can you not take a little bit of criticism? What is this about this current world economics fraternity? If I say game theory has got a serious flaw, they'll turn around and say, oh, hell, you know, instead of saying... Prove that my, you know, yeah. my assumption is actually being correct. No, no, they don't even enga- engage with you. They just say, we won't be listening to her, right? Let us sit quietly in the room. I don't mind. I mean, you know, so a lot of my colleagues, you know, I'm saying they're not even... I'm, ha- I'm having sleepless nights to think about this problem that, hey... You know, why is there no Nash equilibrium in which you and I would do something innovative? Hmm. Surely this is what you see every minute of every day, which is what capitalism is. The person, you know, Joseph Schumpeter said that a long time ago. Now I'm writing this thing about a chapter to a complexity handbook, complexity economics handbook. And so-called heterodox economics, uh, you know, so you think you've got one lot of people, the mainstream economists, who don't want to know uh, you know, where's novelty coming from? The their own, you know, uh, for instance, Paul Romo, who won the Nobel Prize, he said, surely macroeconomists should stop putting 101 shocks, technology shock, wage shocks. He said, these are actions of human beings. It's not shocks. Yeah. So unless you explain where these actions are coming with, which is changing the structure of the economy, you know, we'll be always in the dark because we just... Uh, use sort of shocks everywhere to have the worst one is technology shock because it's just so frequent and it changes up you know all the time particularly within the last sort of century or so yeah i mean what hasn't changed i mean the the, the rate of technology is it, change is, it, is, is accelerating it a, is it a shock if it, if it conti- continually changes and shocks you no, surely I, I, I would have thought economists would get up and think well how come we don't have a model of an epistemic, meaning to say something in our brain, I, you know, either we've got to show our, we are capable, you know, models of rationality, we should be such that we are able to think outside the box, a basic thing like that. No, 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 no. They wouldn't, anybody who tries to suggest it, right, you know, which I have, I've been doing this for some time. It's not like yesterday, today. My entire, I think ever since I heard Ken Binmore I, I planted a seed in my head, I've been thinking about it ever since then from my days at the LSE. I would say Essex has been at least tolerant. They tolerate me because I'm sitting there in my basement room and I'm writing these things. <laughs> they may not be listening to me, but at least I have been fired from my job. But it's been hard work. I mean, I have to say uh, what I call the best of liberal thinking and the best of... Uh, I, I've been accorded that by senior people in the, in the university. They've given me a space because when I set up the center, for computational finance, challenging mainstream economics, uh, you know, Ivor Crew, the vice chancellor himself, gave you know, played this trump card in my favor. Whereas my colleagues were trying to oust me <laughs> in the economics department. But nevertheless, they do tolerate. I mean, you know, so it goes to show 
And then, you know, somebody says, maybe I'm borderline Asperger's. It doesn't bother me what you're thinking about me because I'm busy trying to write what I have to write. Um, but I've had support from elsewhere, like Charles Goodhart, Ken Binmore now, you know, as people say, how has it taken it taken 30 years for me to now come out there, you know, I'm writing not just in economics, I'm writing in bio, you know, in bio systems. Actually, one big uh, break that I got in 20, 2019, I was asked to give a uh, keynote talk about the Digital Foundations of Intelligence, how we became smart and protein. This is the same problem that, and and uh, University of Essex the other day in 20, you know, 2021, November, I think, did a blog about how is it as an economist I got involved in trying to understand how a brain is organized that... Um, it's an interesting thing coming. Yeah, but I said only economists actually, only the idea planted by uh, Ken Binmore, you know, this thing about, uh, you know, what about the liar? What about somebody who can negate anything you can, anything they can predict? So the Nash equilibrium would have to be indeterminism. You'll have to do something new that was not in an original action set. Mm. That that has been that has been eating me up for so long. I mean, you know, and yet. Uh, to produce that object that is not on any list is phenomenal. Uh, you have to know the deepest mathematics. Be oh, right. Yeah, because if it, how do you produce an object that's not on a on a list that somebody's enumerated? Right. You have to produce what's called girdle incompleteness. It has to lie outside, and as as exactly as Ken Binmore said, the only thing that can get you out there is because you perceive your own strategies to be challenged by an adversarial agent. Right. How do you see something that isn't there? And to see something that's not there, hmm. right? So I said the immune system's got that capability. The brain and the immune system are the only two systems in the entire universe that can produce these different uh, alternative um, scenarios. But to what? So it is self-referential, meaning to say you're really concerned about your own codes that are going to be uh, adversarially hacked by the virus mm -hmm. so we have a very strong sense of self you know it is not by accident that we are information processing is self is self-based meaning to say the autonomy of the self and an agenda not to be to be hacked free right. is there from the beginning of multicellular life that is all the way in which information is processed in our entire epistemic cognitive systems both in the immune system and in the brain now this is this is uh, so this is suddenly an epiphany, all because somebody said to me when I was in my early twenties that game there's a problem with the foundations of game theory that nothing new can ever happen in a Nash equilibrium, and and also it's not just that, also it has something to do with girdle. So the two things came together, and then you know um, the 2019 I would say was a watershed because I was invited to Carnegie Mellon by somebody called Bud Mishra, who was the then director of the Courant Institute. It's the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in New York, very famous one. Mm. And we got talking because he was looking at similar things. But I said, Bud, you don't have enough machinery there to produce what you want, you know, this novel object that was not on an original set. So, you know, he was very generous. He gave me a platform, right? And it's a very prestigious platform. There's a conference on bio ICT in Carnegie Mellon and I met people from DARPA and what I literally almost had a standing ovation when I said oh you know the girdle sentence which for 90 years nobody ever knew what it was because it sounds like a very funky esoteric construction would you know it, it, it uh, proposition st st says of itself I can neither be proved nor disproved right now that sounds really really funky right and nobody can make up why what that has anything to do with the real world but what it is, is this is a fixed point of a negation function. So immediately when I put it into the perspective of, uh, you know, the immune system and all that, it became very clear to me that it is any biotic element, which, you know, in a girdle system, it will have a unique identifier. And this object would then able, you know, it's being negated. It, it's able to work out uh, from that fixed point of that negation function. But remember, the negation function can be one of, an uncountable infinite ways in which a code can be negated. So he gave me that uh, that that platform, and as a result of that, um, I then got invited by somebody called Mikhail Propopenko uh, at the University of Sydney 
when they had the complexity symposium. So I then got into this in a very big way about intelligence itself. Mm. And, um, but you know what? So, so it's so interesting. It's all this, it's the same issue about, uh, that we are intelligent agents who can think outside the box. Mm. It is this problem in game theory, which is missing in policy design. And then, you know, with, with great, um, consequences, if you overlook this problem about how protein we are, um, the whole system can go to pot right. because you, you, you know, the adversarial agent, if you haven't recognized him for what he's, what he's meant to do and how to set up regulation to handle people like him, the adversarial agent of the rule breaking entity, you, you know, you, your system will not last. Now, the extreme form of this is the, the world we're moving into, the digital system, where a piece of code is pure determinism, right? Yeah. The code, if it's run, will produce an output, the same output wherever, you know, whenever it's run. Now, and that, so it is a sitting duck. Yeah. So the problem in AIG, and this is artificial general intelligence, so I've now, in, you know, I, I, I've, I've um, in conversation with people like Carl Furston, at University College London, he's a big name in neuro neuroscience. He's a different. He has a different perspective because I emphasize code-based systems. I'm saying all our intelligence is code-based ever since the genome um, uh, became encoded in those four letters, and then all inheritable information has to be passed through the genome, no other way. So then we have to take all of that code-based, the code-based nature of things, what I call digital, very seriously. And uh, there are a lot of parallels between the genomic system and the current um, digital economy because the threats are the same. Hmm. We have a phenomenally deterministic system that we need to protect. Uh, so uh, what, what is part and parcel of the genomic intelligence is that the regulation, you know, the regu first and foremost, you've got to get the regulation right because if you have formalism, you know, this is again a child goodhouse thing. You know, if, you, if all formalistic systems become sitting ducks because you can game it, right? Because you know what, how it's going to work. Uh, so if that system has to be secure, then um, you have to have phenomenal. If that is the, the design, or that those are the objectives you want to fulfill, then like the um, immune system and, and all of intelligence itself that's evolved in, in, over, over the millennia, 98% of the genome is is uh, for regulation. Only 2% is protein coding that cre creates your morphology of mind. Everything else is to take care of those codes right. or to take care of life itself. Just quite considerable, really. Yeah. So, so you understand. The burden of good regulation, if you're going to have formalistic systems and determinism writ large, you know, you want to keep a certain world order, then uh, firstly, you have to have regulation but remember, you have to keep it open-ended as well. Uh, so, so I'm saying that this has got huge parallels with the blockchain, you know, this thing that we understand 25th century. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that the original codes have to be kept secure if you want to keep that world order going, you know, life itself going. And then you only new things that can happen. So new things that you have to adapt to in an open-ended way, because our life uh, survival depends on that. You can't close the system down. Because remember, our adversaries are such, or the threats that will happen, let's say, environmentally. But most of this is endogenous. These problems are within life itself or within the uh, uh, economic system. Now, economists are very bad at that. There's a school of thought in the LSC, you know, Daniel, Daniel, Danielson and so on. They try to bring in all this idea of endogenous risk. The risk is not coming from out space. I mean, there are risks, some risks of that kind. But most of the risk is within life forms, like the COVID is actually an adversary from life itself. I mean, you know. Uh, so uh, likewise, in the economic system, most of what's going to happen that's destabilizing the system is other agents. So we need a different paradigm. There has to be a paradigm shift that we embrace complexity and novelty, number one. So I mentioned that the other complexity heterodox economists, and they are just as doctrinaire as the mainstream. They've got their knives into me as well. I mean, they don't want to include me into any of their discussions because I said they've missed a trick mm. by not looking at novelty. They they don't they don't want to go 
where I have gone, right? Girdle and all that. I've been act- actively be told by them to forget about Girdle. Uh, now, why would I forget about Girdle? It's the best idea that I ever got from Ken Binmore and so on, right? Mm. But so, with that, then, what needs to, what in your opinion, needs to be done in terms of the around sort of economics and to actually incorporate that into new systems and actually have that research be conducted and have it, you know, eventually be implemented and. So, so it's a big, big. Uh, so it's a, it's nothing short of a paradigm shift, right? So we're mm. saying. Forget about these models where we say the best thing you can ever do is what you already know. Choose from your given set. Mm. Because that is not how the world, the world of capitalism, as we know, is operating. So the, the world, so I've got three criteria now from my theory of genomic intelligence. I'm saying we're very empathic because you are a projection of me. I know you only because I can mirror reuse my own codes, you know, these mirror neuron systems are actively at work. That's the only way I know you. Social cognition. And I don't see that anywhere, and nobody's acknowledged that in economics, that it's a self-referential activity, right? Second thing, of course, because we co-evolved with this adversarial agent, you know, the virus, we're phenomenally Machiavellian. We, we can understand negation. See, negation, see, the liar is the, you can deceive, right? Because the opposite of something is the other, the other side. Mm. So counterfactuals and things that you know is, is the, um, in fact, um, the highest level of computational intelligence is to recognize what I call the girdle sentence, that there is the fixed point of what is already known, the opposite, the, sorry, the fixed point of a negate, the negation of what is already known. You know, right. to understand non-theorems, what, what cannot work in your system. Right, yeah. And the third thing, of course, we have phenomenally, because of this capability, we require this object. This object is the thing that gets us out of a given set. Um, um, it's called the Cantor diagonal lemma. It has very humble origins to prove that there's always something you missed out in any listing. Now, to do that, we need to have these objects in our own mental makeup that will allow us to switch out. So, uh, so all of these things. Now, again, the, the, another person who told me to look in the direction of Girdle was somebody called F. A. Hayek. You know, uh, Frederick von Hayek. I mean, you know, when I was at the in nineteen eighties, when I was in the LSC, you know, I came from a background from a university called Jawaharlal Nehru University. It was like the Berkeley of India. It means to say it was very socialist and Marxist. So one thing, the only thing I was taught really in economics and anything in, in any way that stuck in my mind was the socialist planning debate. There was a debate between Hayek on one hand and somebody called Oscar Lange, but uh, Hayek said socialist planning will not work uh, because it, it, was a, it was an epistemic, it was a knowledge-based um, critique of why a, a single socialist planner can't plan the diverse uh, numbers of people around, right? Mm. So Hayek's theory, and it's a very uh, he 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 keeps he kept saying in his one or two famous papers uh, about the limits of constructivist reason. So being the sort of precocious person I am, and I pick up things that most other people may not. When I actually had a chance to see him in person before he died. I asked him what are the limits of const- constructivist reason and what he said to me again just completely reinforced what I just heard from Ken Binmore. He said he and Karl Popper were very influenced by uh, this young Austrian, because you know Hayek is Austrian, um, uh, uh, mathematician called Kurt Gödel and I was meant to read Hayek's book called The Sensory Order where he proves that the brain is incomplete. So after I got my tenure in Essex in my early 30s, I decided I'd look at sensory order. And then in a footnote, see, Matt, so Hayek has good intuitions. And I think his um, defense of liberty is the most profound what I've ever come across. He says the only reason you and I need liberty is because we have knowledge that I can't formalize. I can't tell you exactly what it is. It's all, um, you know, it, there's a there's a old fashioned way of talking about that as being tacit knowledge, mm. but it's, it's again part and parcel of this idea that we there is something called cognitive incompleteness. There are things in our brain that we can only precipitate directly through action. We've got to do it. 
Yeah. We can't just, I can't, I can't prove to you. I can't write in formal mathematics. I've got to do it. So he says autonomy of action that you and I autonomous agents is because that knowledge would be lost to the world if you're not given the freedom to act on it. Right. How profound is that? That means we will live in, we will live in a very, um, truncated world if you and I are not given freedom to act because that knowledge would be lost to the world. Well, That's how I understood what he was trying to say, right? So, yeah. autonomy, Because his defense of liberty is an epistemic one that not you, not I could have full knowledge of everything. Yeah, of course. You, yeah. We will, you will have some knowledge that I may not have and vice versa. But unless, and some of it is common because, you know, we formalize things, you know, we, we have things. But the business of thinking outside the box, I've thought out the box, but I can't convey to you because it's part of the incompleteness. It was not on anybody's list. It's a novelty. So for that novel object to be precipitated, I have to actually act on it. And then as an ex, as Richard Dawkins would say, as an extended phenotype, it'll be an artifact you know, like building a new car or, you know, something. We should be allowed to act on that because if we are not allowed to act on that, that piece of information would then get solidified maybe in a artifact outside of ourselves. But after we've done it, then you'll see, ah, oh, that's new. Uh, and there it is that was never previously there. So his thesis is all that knowledge would be lost to the world if we're not allowed to act, you know, on the basis of our autonomous beliefs and um so that is a that is a hugely profound way of defending um what do you call it liberty or autonomy of action sure yeah absolutely so but hayek is but the problem is you see hayek was in chicago university of chicago for a while but then i, I was told that he was ostracized by all the chicago you know the so-called neoclassicals who then in my my view, bastardized this whole uh, avenue of open-ended systems into one that was closed and complete. They tried to make it closed and complete, saying all you got to do is the best of what, from what you know. We are just optimizing agents. Hmm. But in in, in 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 Hayek's world, in my world of genomic intelligence, there's not a single utility function. There's no objective. The only objective is the theorems of your system which is part of the codes that generated you and me. We just want to make sure those codes are kept pristine. Uh, you know, the, the pure girdle system will only protect those codes. They won't tell you how. There's no endogenous way in which the codes themselves can be improved because there is now a new uh, fashionable thing that somehow we can recursively improve ourselves endogenously. I don't think so. The only thing that will happen endogenously, um, you know, in terms of novelty, is these girdle sentences, which is about saying how your original co codes got negated. And from there, you can produce antibodies. But the purpose of that is not to improve yourself. You know, your autonomous autonomous entity, you know, you or me, an organism, is to put, is, it is for the uh, keeping the codes hack free. You know, right. that keeping is- Keeping them the, as they are. Uh, yeah, keeping them as they are. That itself, um, and therefore our innovations are arms races against adversaries who may uh, destroy your your you as an entity as an organism that's how i see it because uh, you know now you say somehow we can really nearly improve our codes we don't know that mechanism yet uh, but whatever that mechanism is it'll never go into the next generation unless that it's copy pasted into that uh, the genome itself you know the point mm -hmm. uh you know that the other big eye opener that economists don't have a clue about is evolution itself there are a big, uh, there's a big uh, paradigm shift with some, uh, you know, this uh, this lady called Barbara McClintock, who in 1984 won this Nobel Prize in physiology, first woman to win it on her on her own right. I mean, um, and uh, she she discovered that the genome was being edited, <laughs> like you would do a word document by what she calls transposons and retrotransposons and transposons. Mm -hmm. Uh, do scissor paste and retro transposons, do copy paste. Now try changing anything in your, so basically what she's saying is software can only be changed by other software. It's not random mutation. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. as was the theory. But then what what changes are accepted? Right. Or can be accepted. Yeah, exactly. Now, so that is, so there's a, uh, you know, somebody called, um, this is, he said, well, what you need is a new diversity selector model, which is what I'm building. You know, we need, it's not randomization and natural selection, which may have its place, but at a very molecular level, at a very, you know, the, 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 the thing that keeps us uh, functioning against the huge threat of the virus sphere, you know, the sort of things that we are up against, you know, other entities, other life that would destroy it, um, is this a thing that I call the genomic blockchain. You know, it's kept uh, all these protein coding blocks uh, immutable, you know, for 3.7... Unchangeable, yeah. Yeah, for 3.7 uh, billion years unchanged. You know, it's, it's a miracle of... You know, how is that possible, given the enemy is so rampant? And then, of course, the new blocks that are added only con- have to be consistent with the original blocks. The prior blocks and they cannot yeah, be, yeah, that's right. And so so we need this. This is a whole new way of thinking. I mean, you know, this this is phenomenally important as well. Again, of great relevance to economists, because I remember when I was doing all this control theory stuff in my PhD in economics at the LSE at the time, those who hold this uh, interest in decentralization. Believe me, till blockchain, the idea of blockchain came about in 2008-9, circa the white paper by Nakamoto, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto. In my belief, we, we wouldn't have a clue how to create decentralized systems because all these things that we used to talk about decentralization prior to blockchain, in all of these systems, it was optimal for the, for the center to cancel local uh, decisions to destroy the autonomy of everybody around. Because always you get a better solution. And this is what neoclassical economics is always about. It's not about decentralized systems, the world we know it. It is all about some centralized social planner, right? So th- this is, so you know, but, but without blockchain, we can never think about what is genuinely a decentralized distributed knowledge that can be kept. Uh, that means the autonomy of the individual nodes can be maintained. Right. Is there like, um, if blockchain and cryptocurrency technology were to be vastly incorporated into economies across the world, like central banks and governments alike, are there situations because of the nature of blockchain technology in that manner and the fact that you know, blocks are created and you know, the, they should not be able to be destroyed or altered and everything built up from that, that there's an ability to mitigate some of these risks that like, we, we are moving into a world where it's just increasingly digital, right? Yeah. So it's software based and all software can be hacked. It's the Achilles heel yeah. of yeah. If all software because it's deterministic, it's there, it can be hacked. Some other code can come and change it. Yeah. And so how do you keep these codes pristine? I mean this this is like I mean this is the same problem that as I said the genome had to tackle in multicellular life. Mm. You know, it's all code based, so you know, codes can be changed. The so next thing you know, whatever that original code was meant to do, it no longer can do, right? Right. So can you imagine what this is a design problem of phenomenal difficulty, right? How this problem can be solved. So um, the Bitcoin, of course, is you, you've got to hire off the Bitcoin from the blockchain concept itself, the distributed ledger. That means distributed means that there are multiple nodes and things like that. And then whatever you did at your node, um, uh, firstly has to be communicated with the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it's already it has no, public view, yeah, it has to be, yeah. So, so think about it, you know, it, people had wondered why is it every cell in the body has the same DNA, right? Mm. Yeah, it, that, that, that would be the first thing that means, uh, whatever is in your node, if I have to know it, then I, I have to have, I have to replicate the same information here. So this is, this is again is, 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 so the answer to this is give every every cell the same code, right? And whenever you change something, it'll automatically be relayed to me because I'm part of that same network, what changed at your node. Because if you can't relay what you did at your node, we have what's called asymmetric information. Economists understand this. Oh, yeah. So you can lie to me what happened at your end because I can't directly so, verify so, yeah. it. So unless I can remotely verify what's happening at your co- at your node, um, cashlessness would never have happened unless, you know, as you know, prior to the fact that we could verify it remotely, 
what is in your balance sheet, what is in your account, how could I use a card, uh, you know, to, yeah. to purchase anything? I would have to come with cash, haven't I, physically? Yeah. Yeah. So the remote verification of what is happening is part of this. Which is another issue that you didn't necessarily have with things, you know, when it was like coin, coinage or gold back in the day, because, you know, it, it, it was. I suppose they had potential issues with uh, minting of coins and how, you know, how what constituted like a full gold coin, for example, but it seems to be like a uniquely issue but with like digital money and currency. In the world yeah, I mean, you know, cashlessness, of pri 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 why we why we always had to walk around with watch of notes or coins and all those things is because you won't part with your goods uh, for my money unless I could literally, uh, you know, they say, you know, in America, they used to say in the Midwest, in God do we trust, but everything else is cash, yep. right? Yeah. So what for? I mean, now, of course, I go with a card and you're prepared to just swipe it uh, and you part with your goods. Why is that? Because you can remotely check whether I have the balances. So yeah. I don't need to carry it with me, right? I've got the balances in an account. Remotely, you can verify that. Yeah. So that means the problem of asymmetric information is is solved because you can remotely check it. Yeah, yeah, this, is, this, is, this is a huge advance in technology. So cashlessness would never have happened unless it was a huge advance in technology. In the early 2000s, 2003 or something, I wrote a paper about cashlessness. This thing about you could verify things remotely was the beginning of cashlessness. Your bank, bank balances could be remotely checked. Now we've taken it to such a degree of sophistication. But the problem then, um, the Bitcoin problem is um, different from the the concept of you know blockchain there's there are big movements in the in in um, california and all that called the decentralized autonomous systems where they want to embed that in blockchain for the you know but i don't think any i don't think any man-made design of blockchain at the moment is secure enough i mean i don't need to tell you about uh i mean you know what happened in in uh you know this chap bankman fried and his FTX. <laughs> yeah, well, nothing. Else, so. <laughs> I, I thought of the surname like Bankman. I, I yes. think, yeah. I've been powerful on the live about this one. <laughs> yeah. So um, remember, I told you there's a link between what Bankman Fry did to what banks were doing. Um, you know, where they created liability uh, assets called credit. You know, the uh, residential mortgage-backed securities, and they used the same assets that they created, not out of thin air, but yeah, out of thin air, because they just agreed to give you a loan, right? Mm -hmm. And then they use those same assets to do use as collateral to repo, right? Yeah. Back when Fried did the same trick, <laughs> his, his digital tokens, back when Fried digital tokens, you know, his own assets, as it were, uh, were then used as collateral to borrow money but that is only as good as Bankman Fried in Cop Incorporated, right? You know, so the minute uh, he was using his own tokens to uh, borrow money as collateral, right? Then uh, the value of tokens is collapsing. You know, his credit lines will be gone, right? Which is yeah. basically so. Bankman Fried was doing exactly the same thing uh, that you know these banks were doing at the time. So we've gone through a lot of stuff, and um, so you, you you've got to see that the uh, the the specific problem about the quantitative easing in two thousand and eight from now two thousand and nine to twenty fourteen, you know, UK did they stepped in they what they were doing in the UK they bought government bonds, which is gilts, uh, they bought it from institutions and so on, mm -hmm. and um, they were wanting to pump in. Uh, reserves into the banking system to yeah. give them liquidity. So the question everybody asks is now if banks have all this liquidity, how come they never lent it to anybody? Then they'd say oh, it's because oh, anyway, in a contracting economy, there was no demand for loans. No. But that's not entirely true. So what happened there? So again, why, uh, why did bank lending to the real sector fall? So correcting for the demand side, something very interesting happened. What happened that our paper, uh, you know, our 2003 paper about quantitative easing and bank, banks don't lend to the real economy or real to businesses is that uh, the, the really, the, the I think Bank of England pretty soon realized that they're not going to let, 
the bank lending channel doesn't work. You know, it's not like when you buy the uh, gilts from various institutions, remember they are crediting those accounts. Uh, so what happens there is that um, the, um, those, so you, you're basically crediting, um, in, you know, financial institutions like pension funds or whoever sold the gilts to the Bank of England. So that is not going to immediately convert into a purchase of goods and services. But what interestingly happened was it all, the only inflation that took place at that time was inflation in asset bubbles, you know, in the stock market and all that. Yeah. So because the yields fell, what happened was that uh, the corporate sector, the f big firms as opposed to SMEs, SMEs don't have access, they can't actually um, issue bonds. The, the big firms, uh, the corporates, substituted away from bank debt to issuing their own bonds because now the yield, they have to only pay very low amounts of interest on their bonds. Yep. So they so substituted, so bank lending fell partly because uh, the big big firms substituted away from bank loans. And anyway, the SMEs got stuffed because you know banks don't lend to SMEs to begin with because of that risk weight thing. Yep. So all along, all, all in all, you know, the lending to the real economy fell rather than increased in the years from 2009 and 2014, despite, and the only people that the banks were lending to were for mortgages. So it is, hist you know, repeat of everything, but with a very bad, bad outcome that some people had already been warning that corporates, again, were not going to lend to the real economy. God, what did they do with all the money they raised with bonds? They increased it, increased their indebtedness and they were using the money they got from bonds to buy back their own shares to, in, to inflate their share prices in the stock market. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, so what, what sort of world have we got ourselves into? No money, see, if, if GDP doesn't grow, it's because there isn't enough investment in the real economy. Mm. The financial sector is no longer geared to lending to the real economy. Every macro policy that's come in has not encouraged uh, anybody in the financial system to lend to the real economy. So, so the, the question is then, how do you go about mitigating that and actually get funds into the real economy? Now, so you need you need you need uh, some. This is why people like you know, uh, May, you know Maynard Keynes. You need people to think out of the box and, you know, come up with solutions, right? Instead, we do more of the same, more of this game. You're scared to change anything. Okay, now, now, all right, and you might say, how about what just recently happened? So, so you, you've understood that the dynamics never, ever were going to get any money into the real economy, though they needed to grow GDP, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It wasn't going to go into the real economy. So we had asset bubbles, we had stock prices moving, we had all sorts of things. More QE, all that was happening is more speculation, uh, you know, more bubbles in the financial markets and things like that. And then we have, um, you know, the, the, the COVID. So we haven't yet recovered. We're still with this life support systems from the 2007-8. We still have huge indebtedness and everything else. COVID comes along and um, this follow scheme. Now, yeah, an enormous amount of QE again. Yeah, the follow scheme, no, no, QE didn't create uh, inflation in the retail price index. Remember, QE only okay. created inflation in the assets in stock prices, as right. I told yeah. you, because the money was not going to the households. But with, with COVID, suddenly, you know, we had this entire sectors of the economy shutting down, mm. and there was a furlough scheme. So, 70 mil billion was pumped in in one year. In twenty in 20, 2019 to twenty twenty one, you had seventy billion, and this is pure helicopter drops of money into mm -hmm. household accounts. Yes, not backed by GDP immediately. That's what you call inflation. See, every other when we said during cashlessness, the reason why we had very low inflation was because cashlessness in normal conditions, when there is no helicopter money, if you're using debit card, which I have evidence for the proportion debit debit card payments always trumps credit card payments. So debit card is only circulating. Now, if I use my debit card, 
uh, I've already contributed to my G to GDP growth because of I get paid by University of Essex who puts like, money into my Barclays account. I use the Visa card from Barclays to pay for goods and services. So that's already backed by GDP because I'm using only my my the income that I got. Yeah, exactly. If you and I are using debit cards, just circulating the income that we generated as a result of services we rendered or goods we sold, it's already backed by GDP. In yeah. today's parlance, you'd say there was proof of work. Sure. Proof of work is already there, so it's not going to be inflationary. Mm -hmm. So no new money is being generated. I'm simply debiting my account, crediting the merchant's account. Yeah. But the, the my account already has proof of work because the money that came into me is already backed by the services I did that month. Correct, yeah. Right. So how is that? So that's why inflation came down to 2.5%. And I've been telling people the reason why inflation came down to 2.5% is because of all these innovations in payments systems, because of all this debit card business, proof of work that my I'm only debiting my account through debit cards. Uh, it has already got proof of work. I've already created goods and services to that 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 uh, quanta of which my income is, and I'm just using that. Mm. That would be anti-inflationary, and inflation came to two and a half percent. Whereas other people say, oh, it's because something that the Bank of England did because they're targeting inflation. I don't think so, I, and or it's cheap goods from China and that sort of thing. No, there was a phenomenal revolution in our payment systems, which allowed us to create an anti-inflationary anti line of um, uh, of payments where if, if you're not using de credit cards, even credit cards, if you, when you repay it, it's not permanent inflation. Hmm. What creates permanent inflation is like a helicopter drop where suddenly 70 billion goes into, pro into household accounts, right? Right, and then they can then spend and that, that money. Yeah, that, that, that's not bad. That's the, there is no if it is if if it is uh, a deficit spending which it was, remember it's, it's not backed by yeah anything. it's not backed by there's no proof of work for any of that immediately in in a contracting economy where GDP is falling, you know it's, at the end of the day as Milton Friedman says inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomena it's a really more cash chasing fewer goods. Hmm. So immediately, the translated in double engine inflation, of course, you know, uh, throw into the mix all this thing about Ukraine, oil price, price shock, Brexit, quite frankly, Brexit, name it, anything that contracted the, you know, GDP, and we now have spending power, spending power of seventy billion helicopter drops, not bad. I mean, you know, did he have a choice? I agree that we had to support. Others immediately we would have had unemployment and we may have gone into, but then we should have corrected. Bring it back, bring it back. Then. But long before that, we shouldn't have kept QE going with low interest rates for so long. That was all sort of, but QE didn't cause inflation in the RPI index for the reasons I told you. The current QE, I think that's the last questions you asked me to touch on. Um, do, you, do you want to uh, sort of the, the debacle of the, mini budget on the 23rd of September, quasi Kotang. And mm. strangely, you know, I was saying, you know, they were trying to, strangely, this is, they used to, there is a new uh, idea on the block called uh, modern monetary theory. But then I was told by David Bollard, who's the chief data scientist for Barclays the other day, but Sherry, you know, why did the conservatives, isn't that a lefty sort of thing? The idea that, um, you know, if you have monopoly of the mint, uh, you would really, you don't need to worry about, uh, you know, debt. You know, you could just monetize debt. Uh, why would you run into problems, right? So the the so-called treasury orthodoxy is saying, of course, you know, somebody's got to pay for debt. You can't have, sure. uh, you know, unaccounted, unfunded, uh, you know, uh, deficits. You just can't do it. So they say that's an orthodoxy, but then we, we saw, we tested it in real time, right? Whether that is an orthodoxy. So I mean, this Kwasi Kotang saying, we'll rip up all our tax, um, you, know, uh, you know, reduce taxes, you know, phenomenally, and then run up all these deficits. Don't worry about austerity. We can spend like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. Bad, you know. 
In terms of, I guess the idea really behind it was, you know, again, was a, I guess a very simple one, cut taxes, put money into people's pockets so that they can deal with rising, you know, interest costs and targeting. I mean, besides the fact that, you know, it's been long thought in economics that you can't just, you know, cut taxes and it actually affects, you know, the, you know SME general activity because, it, you know, the, the bulk of tax paying people are those in the higher income brackets that in all likelihood are just going to go purchase assets anyway you know it's the people that are you know lower off in the set lower down the system that you know could just, yeah, it, if it, anything it, use those cuts so that you can encourage spending and things like that but you know it's you know it was just one i don't know so so for what it's worth i mean you know the markets took fright but here's the point uh why again qe had to be brought in on this white charger the horse um was because uh, every is because again the yields went up mm. on government bonds. Yields meaning you know there's an inverse relationship between yields and price. So if the yields on a bond of on government bonds go up, its price falls. Right. Now the pension funds. Now this is, but none of this is a black swan event. This is what my theory is. Black swan event means that oh it was bought from the blue. But I said, if you had joined up thinking, you would have seen there should be people in the systemic risk units of all of these central banks and IMF, which is not how anything is done. Everything's done in an ad hoc, shambolic way, because, you know, you don't, we don't have models capable of putting, you know, big financial flows, these interconnections together, which yeah, we, sure. should, we should do, matter of utmost um, urgency. Because in my book, when interest rates have been historically low, for so long, it's only going to go up. If it's not tomorrow, it's going. If it's not today, it's going to be tomorrow, mm. right? In fact, policymakers should have taken us higher up on the interest rate. You know, zero interest rates is is the recipe that brought Japan to its knees. You know, mm. you know, QE started in Japan. Sure, of course, mm. and well, they have a completely different well other set of issues. But of course, you know, inflation is a completely different issue over there as well. Um, so, so the story with the pension funds, I mean, you know, the pension funds have a system. I mean, it's called, oh, my God. I mean, it's like it's called um, LDI, where liability driven investment uh, policies, right? LDI, they they had, you know, they, they do liability management. You know what pension funds have to do. They have to create enough cash flow on the asset side to pay off new cohorts of retirees, right? This is what they have to do. That was the last straw, you know, in the sense that the pension funds had, um, they used the gilts to provide them with a buffer in these LDI funds. Mm. So suddenly, because the value of uh, gilts fell, that buffer started losing value. So either the pension funds had to uh, replace gilts with other assets, right? They'd had to sell it and pro provide the cash, literally. Um, or they had to sell the gilts themselves. But you can't sell any more gilts because they already, you know, the, the price of gilts had fallen so much, 50 basis points, as it were, like in one month and things like that. You know, never, never seen the likes of that. So if the Bank of England had not stepped in promising to buy up 65 billion worth of gilts at that point, I mean, I'll tell you, I think my pension fund would have just disappeared. Mm. Yeah. You know, we would have had a pension crisis of such, uh, uh, you know, si si seismic sort of levels that uh, we would have impoverished <laughs> myself and everybody else who's coming up for retirement in mm -hmm. the next five to ten years, right? I mean, it was, so they had to do it. At yeah. least they, they stepped in because they hadn't. And then, of course, fortunately, uh, people like um, Liz and all that were turfed out. Yeah. And then we have, you know, as you know. So that is the story of, uh, you know, why banks don't lend to the real economy, what is the consequence of QE, how did inflation come about, what's gone completely wrong in my opinion, it's bad economics, we've got a model of the world which is totally not in keeping with um, how you and I are intelligent, our models of rationality is up the creek, you know, we have a model of optimization saying we'll only do what's already known, uh, completely wrong. This whole business of you and I would game the system, so they haven't taken bin more, and 
Charles Goodhart. This is what I'm saying. Good original thinking from the LSE was not given the time of day. Instead, we've got bogus models from North America elsewhere because we have to publish in their papers. Why is that? Because you get kudos for the research excellence framework. Uh, you know, if I publish somewhere, even if it's garbage, it, provided it's published somewhere in this right insignia. So we are, we are substituting authority. We are completely cutting off critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, Goodhart and Binmore were the original thinkers whose, whose great ideas I haven't seen the you know, time of day, as it were. Why? Because it goes against, uh, you know, uh, whatever is coming from North America, right? Yeah. So. Sure. And if, I guess just to quickly end on, but uh, if there was a piece of research or an article or a piece of, you know, a, a journal that you'd recommend someone to read to really sort of enca encapsulate this and to expand their read their knowledge around this computation analysis and this kind of research, where would you sort of direct them to? I mean, I'd say, you know, as I, as, as I tell my students, I mean, I only teach from my own lecture notes. I said the first board of call is like, read some of my papers if you can. I mean, I've been told that I write, what is the word, densely, you know, it's not very easy to get into my stuff. But some of the papers, when you get into it, I mean, I think, I think the QE paper, which I wrote with one of my PhD students who's now at the Bank of England, Mahmoud Fatou, two of my PhD students, Simone Giacente, I think that paper about QE, I think is reasonably you know easy to access uh it goes against the grain of what other people are saying though lots of people have now acknowledged i mean you know uh hell uh, banks don't lend to the real economy it must have done i saw i saw an article by acca now you know the other accountants if they're saying that have you not noticed that banks don't lend to the real economy <laughs> right no, but it's not made front and center hmm. uh, i mean political parties I think Boris had this great idea of leveling, leveling up. We have to level up. There is no two ways because all of North of England is completely, uh, you know, in a state of dysto dystopian dysfunction, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. Okay, that, that's another long story. It's about globalization where we completely yeah. lost the plot. Yeah, and just, you know, the movement of certain services down to the south and just absolutely, you know, just sort of stranding the north in a lot of the ways. Well, you know, that's partly why, you know, projects like, you know, HS2 are, Supposedly, right, so we're going to hopefully bring some of that commerce and uh, ingenuity back to from you know, connecting the north to the south. Yeah, bit, I mean, British ingenu ingenuity, I mean, that's what I was saying. You know, I, I, I am a great anglophile, I mean, of the British ilk. I love, um, you know, I, this is the only country that I would know of somebody stand uh, in the middle of parliament and try and free slaves 3,000 miles away. No other, no civilization will produce anything of that ilk. I'm that much of an anglophile, mm. uh, to the point that the other day uh, I was talking to somebody who was in the Home Office, and there I was defending the British <laughs> British way of life and your liberal ethos, mm. right? And they 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 are they what I what I call the white hating people. I mean, they they are full of angst uh, about their own civil uh, their own um, culture. They couldn't find one good thing to say about their own culture. I, I mean, it just it, takes right? my yeah. breath away. And I, then why are people r r fleeing from stateless countries, you know, failed states to come here? I mean, uh, and why, why am I, and my, my son would say, mom, if, if you're so worried about this, why, why are you here? Why don't you take yourself back to <laughs> where I you think, came from? I think a lot of it is media driven and uh, so sort of culturally, there's definitely been some, uh, a kind of shift, but also, you know, that there's, you know, you could talk about loss aversion, right? People are more sensitive to, you know, negative things than they are to positive. I think, you know, particularly with, you know, media and the way it's become, you know, things like this, YouTube, social media, articles, you know, it, it's easy to push an agenda and have get a bit of reaction out of people that is more negative, I suppose. And in reality, I think, yeah, that we do a lot of good stuff. Not that, like I say, we have a lot of work to do in terms of like, our, our, Research and they just talk about the computation of work, but it doesn't mean that you know the foundation isn't you know one that's solid and sh should be protected. I guess. No, every 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 generation has to reinvent. You know, you can't just take it as given. See whatever Hayek said and all that. His his intuitions were correct, but he was nowhere close to coming up with the whole picture. Mm. You know, certain times, just like um, as I told you about decentralization, I and mean, the bit 
the the blockchain is one of the biggest ideas that human civilizations ever discovered. I mean, we've had an ancient precedent, like I said, told you the genome is a blockchain. Yeah. So we didn't invent that, right? But no. now we are coming up with the human one. It'll be another another conversation with you about why the human one is not exactly the way in which the genomic one is designed. And unless we make our human one more like the genomic one, we don't stand a chance um, because of other reasons. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I guess that's where we're ended today. Um, thank you very much for taking the time. I do appreciate it. I think it's been really insightful. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I think we've covered everything under the sun. <laughs> okay, thank you for joining us. Yeah, guys. thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of the Marginal Babble podcast. If you did enjoy, please give us a like or a comment down below for any future topics you would like to see discussed. But until then, see you soon.